Matthew chapter 19. Continuing on in the study of follow me. Follow me. Today we're talking about singleness of heart. Now if you read Matthew 19 just at its face value, I know that there's, there's primary application to, to simply just being discussing marriage. The Pharisees come, they tempt him with a question about divorce, and he deals with marriage, one man, one woman, forever, and uh, gives one opportunity for leave, but basically puts it under the blanket of, but default is never, ever, ever divorce. <laughs> and then continues on. But... As I have found, and as I believe Jesus has been doing, especially since the transfiguration, he's now bringing his disciples along in a journey that is is one of, of learning, it's one of faith and following. It, it's the same thing from the beginning, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, but perhaps he's getting a little bit deeper in his teaching here. And so Jesus, as he often does, he rebukes the Pharisees, at the same time tries to de- teach his disciples a spiritual lesson and a spiritual truth. Because quite often, you'll find, as begins in verse 10, he rebukes the Pharisees, and then the disciples are brought aside to learn a little bit more about the parable, a little bit more about the rebuke, a little bit more about the lesson that the Pharisees, of course, missed. (laughs) So... As he often does, he speaks in dark sayings unto those that would not believe, do not want to believe, do not want to hear this word. And then he clears it up with disciples. Here I think he's teaching primarily following God in singleness of heart. In other words, dedicated, devoted, solely upon following, serving, loving the Lord. Matthew chapter 19 In verse 1 it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. So you think to yourself, well, there's a great healing taking place. This is wonderful. Everybody that comes and follows Jesus is getting healed. Everybody around should be exciting and rejoicing over this. When their aunts and their uncles and their friends and their close family members and those that they are their colleagues and people of the town that were of of reputation are all coming to Jesus and being healed. Everyone clearly should be excited about this. But of course, there's the Pharisees in verse 3. And these workers of iniquity certainly can't allow this. For envy, the Bible says, they crucified Jesus and you see it. In that every time good things are happening around Christ, they want to, look at what it says in verse 3, tempt him. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now whenever the Pharisees came tempting Jesus, they did it with the intent to catch him in his words. to, To catch him either disobeying the law of God or the law of the land. And so Jesus, of course, wise to this, sees this question as as no different. This is a temptation. This is a trick. This is a trap. And they ask him, is it lawful? Now, whether they're talking about the law of God or the law of man, we don't really know here, do we? But they ask, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Every cause. Every cause. Is there a list? (laughs) Made me wonder because... You would probably say for all causes, for any, any cause, if, if it was just, you know, a list that was eternal and went on forever. It seems like there is actually a finite amount of causes that the Pharisees are dealing with. My presumption, and I haven't went and studied it out, but I would assume, like they, like they do with many of the other things, that if you went to one of their, one of their books that are volumes long, their, their, their blasphemous Talmud or, or otherwise, you would probably find therein the Jews have an actual list of reasons why you could divorce somebody. And I bet you it's bit pretty horrendous. <laughs> but this might be what he's referring to, every cause. Every cause in that list. Can we divorce our wife? Put her away. Now, Jesus responds, as he often does, and you'll find it actually in six different places in this very Gospel of Matthew. 
Verse 4, it says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? I love that when he basically just appeals to the highest of laws. And that's what makes me think this lawful statement is probably pointing it, pointing to their law, to their Talmud, to their, um, perhaps at this time, oral traditions that they held. Um, is it lawful for every cause to be implemented for putting away your wife? And Jesus says, have you not read? He, of course, is appearing appealing to the law, the law of God, the holy scriptures. And so he says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Now you can go there, keeping your finger in Matthew chapter 20, or Matthew 19, go to Genesis chapter 2. And so Jesus appeals to the law and he says, he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. The Bible in Genesis 1.27 says, Male and female created he them. And that's what he's referring to there. But if you look across in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 23, you'll find the second portion of what he was talking about. It says in Genesis 2 verse 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now this is an interesting thing. If you have Matthew 19 readily available, he says in verse 4, in the second half, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? I believe that's referring to Genesis 1, 27. In verse 5 it says, and said... For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Now, this might be just more interesting than anything to me. But if you look, he says, Have ye not read, verse 4, that he which made them, now look down in verse 5, and said, he which made them and said. So we're connecting, actually, that the Creator and who spoke, verse 5, are the same person. Do you see that there? Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, and again, maybe this is just interesting. Maybe this won't come up ever, but you find verse 23 says, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And that's continuing in Adam's tradition of actually naming all of the creatures. He named, you know, the, the zebra, the giraffe, the, the hippopotamus. And now he gets to name the woman because she was taken out of man. The next statement where it says, therefore, is back to the narrator. It's back to God Almighty speaking directly. This actually isn't Adam's continuation. It says, therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And of course, Matthew chapter 19 affirms that, I believe, and it says, he which made them and said for this cause shall a man, they're one and the same. So the creator actually said those words. I don't know if that'll ever become a challenge for you, but it's just one thing that I, I kind of notice and I grab a hold to, and it's actually very good in scriptural interpretation to catch those changes. Now we have the New Testament pointing back to Genesis 3 saying that Adam said something and that therefore is now God speaking. If I was just reading it and I have read it a hundred million times before maybe, not that many of course, I would have read it and said I was just continually talking. Therefore, therefore, and that continues on in his thought. Why is that important? Well, because now you've, you've, you've got the New Testament telling you that that's not the case. And you can actually... In your Bible study, find things like that and be attentive to things like that because it'll help you to basically discern voices, right? If it's the narrator in the Bible, it's always true. What he says is true is always right. But there are people that talk in the Bible, and what they say, though it's true they said it, what they said might not be true. And so I could look at something like that in a different context, perhaps, and maybe it's you know, a king talking, right? I can't take what the king says as gospel truth unless I have a scripture that actually reinforces that and says, you know, thus saith the Lord. The apostle Paul does this all the time with words that men say. He, he says, this is gospel. This is the truth. Just for example, I'm not saying this is the case, but maybe what Adam said wasn't exactly correct, right? And you could take 
another example in the in the Old Testament where somebody says something that's not exactly correct. But you know now from the New Testament that what came after was 100%, and this is what Jesus is appealing to. He's appealing back to the fact that for this cause, in other words, male and female are created, they shall become one flesh, these twain. And that's exactly what he's saying in verse 5, pointing back to Genesis 2, verse 24. Again, may just be an interesting thing that I just picked on up on, but that was very interesting to me to notice that there was a distinction made because I've always read it as one thought. So, this then, back in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5 and verse 4, are cases of thus saith the Lord. Not just Adam in the case of verse 5, but thus saith the Lord. God essentially through Jesus here in Matthew 19 has put a stamp of approval on that, that this is the word of God, not just the word of a man. And that might be an interesting thing then to actually grab a hold of because who are the Pharisees appealing unto in all of this? The word of a man, some law. Is it lawful for me to put away for any cause? And Jesus is saying, haven't you read the Bible? Haven't you read what God said when he made them male and female and he said that a man and a wife shall cleave one to another and be one flesh? In verse 6, he's going to clarify. He says, wherefore, they, that are, they are no more twain. They are one flesh. He says, but wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And so there's the rule. The rule is one man, one wife forever. Men do not put that asunder, whether that's the couple trying to split up or someone trying to split up the couple. It's very clear that marriage is one man, one woman forever. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Verse 6, he's saying this is what it means. This is the interpretation. This is the primary application of the scriptures here. Now, again, I'm going to get on to a Another couple lessons since Jesus is saying, have ye not read, on scripture reading itself. Go to, keeping your finger in Matthew 19, Nehemiah. Nehemiah is before Psalms, it's before Job, and it's before Esther. So Psalms is pretty easy to find. I often forget where Nehemiah is as well. It seems counterintuitive that it's there for some reason. So Psalms, then before that is Job, and before that is Esther, and before that you'll have Nehemiah, and in chapter 8. And there's this amazing thing that you find in Nehemiah chapter 8 is actually a little bit of an outline of Ezra the scribe as he stands before the people proclaiming the law and preaching the word of God. And he gives you some actual practical ways that we can improve our reading and our understanding and our even preaching of the word of God. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8 and in verse 1. It says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of man and woman, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from midday, from morning until midday, before the men and the woman and all those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And so Jesus in the New Testament says, have ye not read? And here in Nehemiah, we actually find a pattern for Ezra showing how ye read in the book of the law. First of all, a specific time set aside. Look at verse 3. It says, he read therein from the morning until midday. And so he had the opportunity to before the people from morning until noon, read unto them. And that could be the pattern for when we generally have church service. We get up in the morning and we go until midday. It says, have a specific time set aside. So you in your personal life, you should set aside a specific time. Whether that is in the morning or whether that is at night, I would encourage the morning because at night you're exhausted, you're just going to fall asleep. You're more apt to cancel your Bible reading and jump into your nice cozy bed if that's your time at nighttime. But some of us can do it. Some of us are night owls as it were. But have a specific time 
And at that time, the Bible says we ought to be attentive to the word of the Lord. The end of verse 3. The ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Now, some people look at where it says those that could understand, and they say, well, you know, the children are included, and they maybe use that as an opportunity to put the children into some Sunday school where they laugh and play and sing and do all sorts of things other than hearing the reading and the preaching of the word of God. But it's, it's very plain here that the men and the women are there, and those that could understand are included but that doesn't necessarily exclude those that could understand because otherwise who's taking care of the babies if all the men and all the women are there everybody all the people were there and they were attentive under the book of the law our application have a specific time where you can be attentive to your reading where you can pay attention where you can turn off distractions where no one's going to bother you again this is why i say the morning Get up before everybody, and then that way you have a good chance of not being bothered by the text, the emails, the family, whatever it is. <clears throat> now we continued on in verse 5. It says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he had opened it, all the people stood up. So I don't know how clearly we can see. Verse 3 says, All the people were attentive to the law. Verse 5 says, all the people were in the sight of Ezra. All the people, he stood above and he opened the book in front of all the people and they stood there before him. Everybody of Israel is there present to hear. And so then, all people need to hear the word of God. There's a practical application. Nobody can say, you know, a wife can't say, oh, my husband reads that. I don't need to read that. And the kids can't say, you know what, mom and dad read the book of law. I don't need to read that. Everybody needs to hear the word of God. Continuing on in verse 6, it says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And look, all of this is happening just as the Bible is being read. I stood up and I read the entirety of Joshua chapter 7 here, and nobody was jumping and shouting and saying Amen and getting super overly excited about that. Why? I don't know. Maybe we're just we're just like chill in Canada. We don't get too excited about anything. But <clears throat> I think the thing is is that the people understood the preciousness of the word of God. Maybe we're a little bit jaded. We have it at our fingertips all the time. We can read the Bible whenever we want. We have a phone app with it. But here the people quite often wouldn't hear it until that singular copy, because it took so long to write it out by hand, was brought before the people and they read it out that when they heard the word of God they freaked out. They got excited. They're shouting, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, praising God. And the Bible says that Ezra then blessed the Lord, the great God, at that time. So here's a practical application for you. Reading your Bible, hearing the Bible being read, is an act of worship. It is an act that blesses the Lord God Almighty. Don't start to think of reading your Bible because we get so... Um, what's the word? We just get so used to it. We, we know it's there. We have it readily available. Don't get to the point where it just becomes mundane and blah to us. Understand that this is a precious word, even though you may have 50 in your houses. And it is an act of worship, and it is something that blesses God Almighty God when it is done. I always think to myself of that video of the, the Christians in China receiving a, a package, a shipment of Bibles and seeing them in this dimly lit room, perhaps in an underground church, cutting this thing open, everybody grabbing a Bible and going like this. And smelling it. When was the last time you smelled your Bible? Gave it a good whiff. Mm, that's good. I mean, people that don't have this find it precious. And I bet when it's read in their audience they get excited they shout amen and and we're just we're just jaded on this thing this whole book we we've all got it we yeah 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 i can skip my bible this is worship this is praise so set aside a time be attentive in that time everybody needs to hear this and understand that this is an act of worship to just read in the book of the law and absorb these things and study these things out this is your roadmap. This is your guide. This is your, your, your lifeline. We need to understand that as those in China understand that. As those who have never even handled of the Word of God understand that. It is precious. 
So there's some practicals then for reading, for understanding, for preaching, for teaching from the Word of God. <clears throat> now he continues down, and I would say that this is probably one of the best outlines for how to preach the Word of God. Now, you might be preaching it to a, a friend, a family member, somebody you encounter at the door. You may be preaching it to your children. But verse 8 says this, So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That is preaching of the Bible. It says, They read distinctly. So remember, we've already seen, have a set time, be attentive. Everybody needs to hear this. This is worshiping. This is praising your God when you read the Bible. It says, they read distinctly. Distinctly means apparently or, or clearly. Clearly reading it, just what it says. Not adding too much to it to confuse it, just a clear reading of exactly what is in the Word of God. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, made it clear and plain as they're reading it. Next it says, and gave the sense. You know what sense is? That's adding wisdom. That's adding prudence to it. That's adding insight. That's adding meaning to what you have just read clearly. Next it says, and they caused them to understand the reading. Understanding always is associated with practicals. If, if you understand something, you're able to perform what it says. Knowledge is one thing. Understanding is acted out. And that's why knowledge puffeth, puffeth up, but understanding is actually what Christians need to get more of. So they read the book of the law clearly. They give the sense. They apply wisdom and meaning to what's being said there. In other words, in the context that is there, they just they they highlight some of the key points that you can see there, and they they start to look at the text and draw specifically from the text, giving the sense of it. What does it mean? Here's some insight to what I've read here, and then they cause them to understand the reading. That takes discernment. That takes consideration. That takes a practical application. So. What you do when you're teaching the Bible is, read it plainly, explain the context and what you're having here, then give some practicals, how you can act out what you've heard there. And that's what I've endeavored and tried to do with my preaching, is taking, just walking through a book. We read it plainly, we understand the context of Joshua, and then from there we start to apply certain principles of Joshua's life into our lives. And this is exactly what the Bible prescribes as good, solid preaching. And, and I believe it's primarily um, through, um, not so much topical, but through expository preaching. Because he's saying, you read in the book of the law distinctly. In other words, just, just plainly what's there. So you're reading and reading and reading. The Bible actually says that they read in the Bible. And that's all they've done to date from day until night, right? Or until midday. They're just reading and reading and reading and reading, getting lots of Bible. And then once all of that is presented to the people, then he starts to cause them to understand. Then he starts to give them some meaning and some insight and some sense to what's being read here. My, my contrast there then would be topical preaching. It's, it's more difficult in topical preaching to give a distinct reading and to give sense to what's being read because sense involves the context. A distinct reading involves just plainly laying out what's there. What is topical preaching? Well, if I wanted to talk about love, I have love here, and then I have love there, and then I go over here, and it's love, and I go here, and it's love. And I'm talking about a topic that is, is in the Bible, but I may be taking some of those different verses that I'm using to highlight the topic. I may be taking some of those verses outside of distinction. I may be taking them out of the sense of the word there. I may be taking them out of context in order to talk about the topic. But I believe Nehemiah here and Ezra here are doing the most effective way that you can achieve what Jesus is now attacking the Pharisees for. Have you not read? And if they would have read distinctly, they would know the sense and they would understand the reading. And they wouldn't be coming to Jesus with such a stupid claim that you can just divorce for any cause. Right? You can just divorce divorce a woman for any cause, every cause. Doesn't even matter. I'm just going to get rid of her because I don't like her. Matthew chapter 19. We'll go back there. 
Matthew chapter 19. And again, I'm not trying to lose track, but there's a singleness of heart that's being promoted here in Jesus' teaching. So they ask him then in verse 7. And again, you could go back and see that Jesus did exactly what Nehemiah 8 prescribed. From the context of Genesis 1 and 2, he said very clearly, male and female were made. Man leaves father and mother, cleaves to his wife, they're one flesh. And here's the understanding, right? Distinctly in verse 4. Sense in verse 5. Understanding in verse 6. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. It's kind of like taking a portion of Bible and asking, well, why or what is being said? Why is it being said? Now, how do I apply it to myself? Jesus did exactly that here in this portion of scriptures. And he's doing that to show the Pharisees what they're not doing with the word of God. So the Pharisees, of course, miss it. So in verse 7, they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And you know what I think they've done? I think they've taken their lawful, quote, causes, and they've piled it up with one pretext from Moses, and they've said, look, Moses says just divorce for any cause. No problem. But no big deal. Whatever you want. Because I have that verse from Moses that says that. No, 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 no. They haven't read distinctly in the context of which Moses said it. They haven't gave the sense, applied any kind of prudence, wisdom, insight, or meaning to it in the broader sense of why Moses was doing that to that particular person. And therefore, they have no understanding of the scriptures whatsoever. They've completely left off understand the scriptures and so they're like well moses said i have a verse that says this therefore i'm right you're wrong <laughs> but jesus because he read distinctly because he gave the sense because he understood the reading and the application of it responds with verse 8 another application he saith unto them moses because of the hardness of your heart suffered you to put away your wives but from the beginning it was not so, so they asked the question, well, Moses said to put her away. And that points back to, and you can go in your own time, to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Try it. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 24 and apply what you read in Nehemiah chapter 8, in verse 8. And you're going to find that Jesus is bang on here. Because they had hard hearts, God allowed for putting away of the wives. But here's the key. But from the beginning it was not so. So because of your sins and the hardness and the impudence of your heart, because of that, God suffered, God allowed, God put up with this provision for divorcement. But the beginning is the standard. And what's the beginning? Male, female, together, twain, one flesh, and what God hath put together, let not man put asunder. That's the bottom line teaching here. So Jesus is teaching then, in verse 9, he's going to give you another practical application here. He says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And so Jesus' teaching, I believe, is actually pointing back to, remember the case of Joseph and Mary? Mary was found of a child of the Holy Ghost. Well, there's no rhyme or reason for that as far as the carnal world is speaking. Joseph presumes that Mary has been fornicating. She has been with another man. And so were it not for the intervention of the angel, Moses, mind, or sorry, Joseph minded to put her away privily would have been within obedience to what Jesus is saying here in verse 9. Because of the fornication that took place, he's able to put her away. But, if there be no fornication, you default back to the beginning case, one man, one woman, forever. And so, basically, some uncleanness, she was found to not be a maid, Joseph had presumed then that she had fornicated with somebody else and therefore could put her away. That's kind of what's being taught in Deuteronomy chapter 24, in a nutshell. But Jesus still holds to the fact that Divorcement is adultery. Divorce and remarried 
remarrying is, is adultery here, and this is the bottom line of what he's trying to teach. And adultery, then, is something that is, is worthy of death. Now, Jesus often takes things to the next level as far as Christian obedience is. This is ideal. This is perfect. Now, we all understand that, practically speaking, we live in a fallen, sinful world. A lot of us made sins before we even knew of such a word of God. And so, I believe God has grace for those. I believe that we're all navigating a very complicated and confusing world as a result of sin having entered in. But we need to understand what the Bible is teaching and do our best to adhere unto that in the spirit and in the truth. Now, is Jesus for divorce then? Never. <laughs> Never, never, never would Jesus be for divorce. Why? Because he always appeals back to what happened in the beginning. Male, female, cleave one to another, one flesh, what God put together, no man shall put asunder. So what then is this case of divorce? If Jesus is always for it, why did he give provision where he says, except it be for fornication? Divorce is a construct which is allowed temporarily, I believe, and as a result of this fallen and sinful world. Jesus is always opposed to it. The Bible is always opposed to it. But as a result of this sinful world, divorce entered in. Because we're looking at two different realms of time here. We're looking at the beginning, which was man and woman originally in the garden, a perfect place without sin. God's construct, God's perfect will would have been those are married and together forever, right? And they would have had children. They never would have partaken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Generations after generations would have passed and divorce wouldn't even be a thing. But as a result of sin entering in, now divorce is a construct and a suffering or an allowable by God in certain situations and only because sin even exists in the first place is as a result of our own hard hearts that there's even such thing as divorce being discussed at this time. And the law of the land and the ways of the world in Judea at this time, even compared to where we're standing now, aren't that different. Because look at the response from the, the disciples. Verse 10, it says, His disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. In other words, if, if there is, is no option for divorce, if you're only saying that, that, that divorce be given cause and given option, if there be fornication, which happened like before marriage, which happened in the time of espousals, if, I mean, if, if that's the only out that we have, then we might as well just not get married. Why? Because they're making a statement that shows the hardness of their own hearts as a result of the hardness of the world that they're living in. It's a sinful, fallen world, and I bet you just as it is today, where for every cause, man will put away wife, wife will put away man. You know, I don't like the way she cooked my eggs. Get out. I don't like the way he leaves his socks on the floor. Get out! Every cause, right? The hardness of the world, the sinfulness of the world... It, it, it permeated into even the church. And they're like, well, we should just not get married if we can't just get divorced for anything. If we can't, if we can't have that out, Jesus is trying to show them, look, have ye not read? And this always has to be our default standard for everything. Have ye not read? And of course, <laughs> there comes a time when discernment has to make, when consideration has to be made, when practical application has to be made. And I'm not going to stand up here and give you any kind of causes for divorce. But there are certain causes out there that would cause for a marriage to break up. The Apostle Paul is going to talk about it a little bit later. Where, where the wife just is like, I'm not a believer. He got saved. I'm out of here. There really is no recourse for the man to just hold on to her, chain her down. And if she goes and divorced, he has not sinned. It's, it's not his obligation at this time to hold down that marriage and, and, to, and, to, and to try to fake his way through that, of course. But this is all in the context, again, of the sinful world. But what is God's ultimate desire? No divorce. 
And our desire as Christians ought to be no divorce. Only after every single opportunity and chance and attempt and striving and suffering and praying. After everything you have done to maintain God's perfect will has fallen to pieces. Yeah, there might be an uh, accept it before fornication available. But that needs to be such so far from the Christian's heart and mind for their desire to be single in their heart towards God, that needs to be so far from their hearts that it really is no option. What should our option be when it comes to marriage? One man, one woman, cleaving one to another, one flesh, God put it together, no man put it asunder. Don't even give provision for an out. Don't even give opportunity for an escape. In your heart of hearts, be single in the desire to stay with your spouse forever and teach that to your children as well. No, God has a perfect standard. Well, he, you know, he, he, he stabbed me and ran me over with a car. Okay, now we can probably talk about separation. Like, like just bizarre, outworldly, ridiculous scenarios that might come up. The accept it be for fornication. Again, I'm not going to give you any kind of, of advice that would ever say divorce is, is an option. I, I would never allow that, okay? Because Jesus would never allow it. But let, let's be real here and understand also that we are living in a sinful, fallen world. And some of us have sinned in this area prior to being saved. Many people, Christians, have sinned in these areas prior to any understanding of what God's perfect will for them is. But now that you have read it, and now that someone has given it to you distinctly, given you the sense, and caused you to understand the reading, now you're really without excuse as to falling in line with God's perfect will for this. I hope nobody thinks that I have any provision available or I'd ever give you an opportunity to divorce your spouse for any cause. Because, of course, my judgment is always going to be like Jesus' judgment. God put it together. Don't put it asunder. The disciples are like, man, we might as well just not get married yet because this is the world that we're living in. How do I know if she's not going to run off? How do I know that he's not going to mess? How do I know that, like, like if I have no out... I could be in this abusive, horrible, awful marriage. I will tell you that I've known of people that are in these abusive, harmful, awful marriages. I know of one of the most beautiful Christians I have ever met. Um, passed away a couple years ago. And this woman got saved. And this woman long suffered with a, a husband that was abusive physically, mentally, spiritually towards her. But I never saw her falter in her faith. She was dragged through the renter. She was abused heavily. In her in her later days, I'll just I'll just give you an example that 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 the man would soil himself just for the fun of it. And he was in the diapers, the depends. He would soil himself just to make her clean it up and ridicule her while she was doing that for him faithfully because she was serving and loving her husband as unto Christ. Right? That woman had a singleness of heart that said, God hath joined me together with this man. And what God hath put together, let not man put asunder. God give me grace. And he did, and he used that woman mightily throughout her life in the spiritual things, though she suffered much in the flesh as a result of trying to obey what she had read distinctly and the sense that it made to her. And she understood what God expected from her. And she walked with God like nobody else in one of the worst of scenarios you could imagine for somebody, when everybody would have been like, divorce him, get away from him, separate him. No, she served that man, brought him his meals while he attacked her. She served that man, washed his clothes while he beat her. Right? All of these things she went through to fulfill the word of God in her life. And the apostles might have been considering some of these things. Well, then we should just not get married if it's, a, if it's forever. And that, I think, shows a little bit of the ways of the world that they lived in affecting their minds. We also need to understand that forbidding to marry, though I don't believe that's what the apostles here are trying to do, they're just saying, let's not get married. They're not saying, no, 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 command it that you don't get married. The Catholic Church does do that. But forbidding to marry is a doctrine of devils of the last days. 
commanding to abstain from meats and forbidding to marry. Those are signs of the last days. Um, struggles that Christian faith, doctrines of devils, they're referred to as. But Christians need to have a singleness of heart when it comes to serving God and, and when it comes to going to the heart of the matter of what God expects from them. Have ye not read? And there are scores of scriptures that we can go to and we could probably come up with some excuse as to why we could not do that, but we automatically need to default to what God has wrote. Have ye not read distinctly? Have you understood the sense? Do you understand what you're reading here and can you apply it? We ought to do that first and foremost and as much as in us is, fulfill the word of God without going and making excuses. Now, the disciples make this statement, well then, it's good not to marry. In verse 11 it says, But he said unto him, Jesus speaking, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. So he actually acknowledges that, yeah, it's probably a good idea. <laughs> he said, They say it's good not to marry, and he says, well, yeah, but all men can't receive that saying. Receive that saying, if it's given you, but all men cannot receive that. And then he goes on into verse 12, and I don't want to drag this out of the context in which it's being spoken, because now we're going to talk about eunuchs momentarily. It says, for there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. And verse 11 talks about this as being a gift. Now, in the context we're discussing, eunuchs means not married. Eunuchs, in, in the plainest sense, means not married. Some have, erroneously, I believe, taken this and said, well, a eunuch is when the privy member is removed physically. And some Christians have actually gone as far as to say, well, I'm a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake, and have removed their privy members, trying to remove the temptations that come as a result of that, in order that they could stay single, because it is good not to marry, and Jesus says, well, if you can receive it, you can receive it, and so they have made themselves that way, um, according to the flesh. But I think the context is, is plain here. We're still talking about marriage. And they're saying that it's for the kingdom of heaven's sake that they're eunuchs. First of all, born from the womb. Second of all, made so of men. And third of all, eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. I think practically what we can grab here is that if you are given that gift, if you are chosen for the opportunity to remain not married, it has to be grounded with that focus, purpose, and desire for the kingdom of heaven. Right? Because the thing is, is, is we're going to have a desire to one of two things in this life. And this is what he's going to start to bring to our focus. If you are indeed focused and a eunuch, not married, but want to purpose in your desire towards furthering exclusively the purposes of God in this life, it better come with a firm conviction and, and stance that this is all for God's kingdom and for his sake. You need to be just as devoted then with a singleness of heart to advancing the kingdom as you would then for his wife. So I'm looking at three different things that we need to have a singleness of heart towards. First is the word of God. Have ye not read? Is it not understood plainly what God reads? A singleness of heart towards getting the heart of the matter and understanding at the basis level exactly what God wants for us. Ignoring any excuse or opportunity to deviate from that, I guess, unless it becomes absolutely necessary and there is an accept it be for fornication here. <clears throat> because I believe actually accept it be for fornication. While that is an allowance of Jesus, ultimately from the beginning it was not so. And God would still expect, even if there is fornication, if you've, if you've said you want to get married, you ought to stick with that in singleness of heart. The next is, um, the, the, the word of God I said first, the next is a singleness of heart when it comes to that gift of not being married, that saying, if received, to be a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake. If you're chosen, if you believe that that's your calling, then you need to have a singleness of heart, focus, purpose, and desire towards fulfilling exclusively the purposes of God. You would, as it were, be married to 
Jesus and his purposes. And, and uh, he would be head over you and you would follow him in everything and in all things exclusively without hindrance. <clears throat> but the default then is one of marriage. Now, leaving that for a moment, let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. And while this is a little bit of a, a topical message on having a singleness of heart, and then also marriage by extension, we're going to go to the scriptures, read them distinctly, give the sense, and see if we can get some understanding from them. What's being said here? Why is it being said? And how do we apply the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in its context? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, let's look with me in verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So the Corinthians have wrote to him, well, it's good not to touch a woman. Is this correct? It sounds a lot like the statement the disciples made when they said it is good not to marry. It is good not to touch a woman. Is this a good thing? And I believe Jesus says yes. And I believe actually the Apostle Paul here is going to say yes. I think this affirms their statement from before. But look at verse 2. Because remember, Jesus said regarding not touching a woman, not getting married, let's say, he said, all men cannot receive that. And the Apostle Paul is going to say the same thing. All men cannot receive that. When he says, verse 2, nevertheless, so it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have their own husband. In the previous chapter, in verse 18, it says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And so, is it good not to touch a woman? Is it good not to marry? Is it good to remain single, even if for the kingdom of heaven's sake, with a focus and a purpose and a desire toward the things of God only? Yes, but... To avoid fornication, it's probably better to have a wife. It's probably better to have a husband. Therefore, you're able to focus and give purpose and give desire toward them. Why? Well, look at verse 3. To flee fornication, it says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. In other words, there is a proper marital relationship that allows for the man and the wife to both receive due benevolence and have complete avoidance of fornication or of, God forbid, adultery taking place within the marriage. Due benevolence, in other words, good doing, well doing, in the union of marriage is a wonderful and a blessed thing that will help the normal people, the average person, avoid fornication. This is the thing. And this is why Jesus said... This isn't for every man. Not every man can receive this because most men will fall to fornication if they don't have their own wife. Most women will fall into fornication if they don't have their own husband and if the pair of them are not rendering unto one another the due benevolence involved in that marriage. Look down with me in verse 6. It talks previous about Satan being able to tempt you for your uh, incontinency. In other words, you just can't help yourself if you're, if you're not engaged in that proper marital relationship and the temptation enters in and after temptation, sin, and sin when it is finished, of course, bringeth forth death. Verse 6, it says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. What I believe the Apostle Paul is saying here is, he's saying, look, I'm not commanding you to be married. I'm not commanding you to not be married. I'm not commanding you to have a woman that you can touch. I'm not commanding you to not touch a woman. What I'm commanding, what I'm giving you is, is permission. I'm giving you permit to choose. Verse 7, he says, For I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God. So the Apostle Paul is saying, I would that every man was single completely devoted to, um, with a singleness of heart, serving God, focused and purposed and desired towards Him and His purpose and His ministry alone. I would. That, that would be good. I, I think that would be a great thing to have scores of men serving in the ministry full-time in that way. 
undistracted, but, he says, every man hath his proper gift of God. One after this manner and another after that manner. Do you know what he's saying that? If you're married, that's a gift. If you've been given the opportunity and the desire to be single and serving God, that's also a gift. One after this manner, one after that manner. Verse 8, it says, I say therefore unto the unmarried and widows, it is good for them that they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry for, look at this, it is better to marry than to burn. And I believe that burning is referring to um, the temptation of Satan and falling into that for your incontinency. In other words, you just can't, help yourself you've been outside the protection of marriage and the relationship that goes along with that and therefore you fall into that trap of fornication and you commit that sin against your own body and and that becomes a a great sin unto you at that time but the apostle paul is saying look whether you receive the saying of singleness and have a singleness of heart in that or you receive the gift of marriage and have a singleness of heart and serving in that capacity. They're both good. They're both well. Those are both gifts of God. And both of them last forever. Look at verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. And this is the default. Marriage is forever. If one depart and there's nothing they can do to keep them, remain unmarried and that shall be your current state. Use it. Turn all of the attention you would have had towards that wife and bring it back to God. Verse 12, it says, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believe not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. And so here the charge is pretty plain. That if you dwell with somebody who is an unbeliever, stay that way. If they be pleased to remain in that marriage, stay that way. Because this is always going to be default. Marriage is forever. I'm saved and my wife's not and we're just not getting along is not grounds to leave. If she'd be pleased to dwell with you and she's not going to go away, well, then stay with her. And the same is the case for the saved woman. If the husband be pleased to stay there and he's an unbeliever, stay together. Remain married. But and if they depart, as sometimes they do, then let them depart. Because verse 14, it says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such case, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all the churches. And I'm living testimonies of being saved before my wife was. And there was a time where I was wondering if the unbelieving would depart. I was wondering if she was going to run fleeing and, and, and screaming to the hills because of the fact that I was saved and she was not. There's an immediate rift in the household when that takes place, isn't there? But if she departed, I had to remain unmarried and fall in line with that eunuch calling where I would stay not married, give myself fully with singleness of heart to serving in the kingdom of God and for his sake, but, praise the Lord, she stayed, and that fulfilled, that scripture fulfilled in my life, where, how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And as a result of my testimony and walking before her as a saved believer, eventually she saw the truth, and she, and she, and she believed on Christ, and she got saved, and a little while later she started to turn from the path that she was walking on through God's ministry in her heart and we came together and we had it we have a, a great marriage now and we have wonderful kids and and things are going really well but look divorce never would have been an option for me or for in, in any of those cases and this is what God is saying in singleness of heart in this teaching follow me he talked about first the Bible 
having a single mind towards the plainness of the scriptures and what they are saying distinctly, what the sense of the word is and understanding it so you can practically read it. He says, have a singleness of heart. If you've been called to or for as a result of somebody leaving you, you are now single. Remain a eunuch, but do it for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Remain single, but do it for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And if you're married, do it the same. And being married doesn't exclude you from the ministry, of course, or having a singleness of heart towards serving in the kingdom. Rather, you just have a few more responsibilities. You have now the care of the, the husband will have the care of the wife and the, and the children and, and supporting them. You're not going to be able to, as the Apostle Paul was, just live in a tent going town to town to town unless you, unless you have a wife and kids that are on board with a plan like that. You're gonna, things are going to be a little bit different, but everybody has their proper gift, the Bible says. Everyone has their proper calling, the Bible says. And wherever you're at now, I believe it's good to so remain unless God leads you in one direction. Of course, God will not leave you, lead you into leaving your spouse, of course. But God may lead you if you're single into getting married. God may lead you if you're single into committing yourself into full-time kingdom of heaven servitude work and just forsaking the idea of ever getting married. But bottom line here we have also is that if you're in a marriage where there's unbelievers um, opposite you, you stick with it. You, you decide and, and you set yourself that I'm going to be the greatest example of a Christian husband, the greatest example of a Christian wife that I could be to the glory of God the Father and for the kingdom of heaven's sake in order that peradventure these children could be made holy. Peradventure my wife could be saved as a result of my serving him. Peradventure the husband could be saved as a result of my, my m submission unto him and serving God in his sight. That's what the singleness of heart, this is the bottom line of the message here and I believe is what he's trying to teach his disciples. They're like, well then we should just not marry. And he gives them examples of how, yeah you can choose that or yeah you can choose getting married do it all for the glory of God. Do it all with singleness of heart, serving Him as unto Him, and, and, and do it at, by the book. Have you not read what the Bible says? Do it by the book, lest you end up like these Pharisees who just want to take pretext from the Bible to justify their own lifestyles. Just do what the Bible says in plainness. And that's what God here is expecting of us and how He's leading us. Follow me, he says, and I will make you fishers of men. Thank you, God.